This is What the Fuck America. It's politics for cool people and culture for smart people. I'm your host, Grace Weinstein. On this week's episode, we are talking about what I believe to be an unspoken epidemic lingering among us. Legalized gambling on players and games has taken over. Sports media. It's on the courts. It's on your little brother's phone. It's on your favorite podcast everywhere. And Congress is finally starting to take notice as millions of Americans and some of sports' biggest stars are getting tied up in debt, addiction, and regret. Cheery, right? Okay, before I introduce this week's guest who's going to help us unpack all of that, I went on a little adventure myself. I figured, how could I speak of what I don't know? So I took $100 and what's left of my dignity went straight to the app store and placed my very first sports bet. Here's how that went. I just downloaded FanDuel. I loaded in a copious amount of personal information, agreed to the kind of toothless terms and conditions, and I'm about to throw a hundred bucks over here with Apple Pay. Let's see how this goes. Okay, my payment was rejected, so this is off to a really good start. It says spend wisely. That's the first little kind of check on your pulse that they've given me so far. Now we're at the home page, and this home page is Holy shit, a little overwhelming. One of the first things that I'm seeing on the top of this is it says bet $5, get $200. That's obviously a huge incentive. For someone like me who's absolutely not interested in betting at all, I can't see myself using it, but let's see. Look at all of these betting options. This is fucking nuts. First to score 20 plus points. So I'm gonna scroll down to the March Madness odds. I'm looking at LSU versus Iowa. Anyway, it says the spread is plus 8.5, minus 120, minus 8.5, minus 110. Uh, I would be lying to you if I said I knew what that meant. The reason that I wanted to do this and the reason I'm fixated on this is we're living in a time of such loneliness and such crisis that it's no question why people turn to things like gambling that give them instant gratification, especially if it's just at at your fingertips 24 hours a day with seemingly no limitations because not a lot of government control has come into this. I'm gonna bet on a buzzer beater, okay? I'm gonna bet on a buzzer beater. Two plus points to be scored in the final three seconds of the first half, plus 300. $10 wins $30. I'm gonna wager 20 bucks to win 54. Is this me getting the dopamine hits in real time? Is this what we're talking about? Should I bet on my Boston Celtics? I feel like the number one rule of this is that I shouldn't bet on the team that I actually have emotional stake in. But fuck it, let's do it. Overall, this is obviously an extremely user-friendly experience. Uh, I can't say I'm really getting the point of it, but maybe that'll be different if any of my bets hit. So stay tuned to the end of the episode to see how that all turned out. We've got Madeline Hill here with us, and she is the writer and creator of Impersonal Foul, my favorite Substack newsletter on all things sports and honestly reality TV drama too. Number one thing I want to set the scene with today, and I'm going to read this to you, is this was a recap of the last week in sports. This was a tweet I saw. The NBA integrates live betting odds into its broadcast. Shohei Otani accuses interpreter of stealing slash betting $4.5 million on sports. The Cavaliers coach JB Bickerstaff says his family has been threatened by sports bettors. Tyrese Halliburton says he feels like a prop. He's an NBA player. Another NBA player is being investigated by the NBA for irregularities on prop bets. And that's all just in one week's time. Kind of a lot to take in. But it feels like we might be used to it because we are running in the reality TV world of it all. So we are being well fed by the sports drama this week. You wrote an amazing newsletter on the Shohei Otani ordeal, I think is like the word that I would use to describe it. Where do you stand on whether he's involved in the gambling or not? And tell me a little bit about your feelings on the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me. So the whole Otani scandal began when, in a really series of chaotic and unfortunate events, his team let his interpreter be interviewed by ESPN, basically like admitting to basically gambling Otani's money, upwards of $4.5 million allegedly, um, on all of these series of bets in different sports, not in baseball. Um, But the story has quickly unfolded where his team has like recanted his statement. They um, allege that Otani had nothing to do with it and that, in fact, he wasn't involved at all and had no idea. But 
my personal feelings on the matter, listen, conspiracy theories are going to say what they're going to say, but how I feel about it is that how could you not know that $4.5 million were being taken out of your account? I don't have $4.5 million in my checking account or many multiple accounts that I imagine Otani has, same. but I don't understand how this, how does this man like not know where $4.5 million went from his interpreter? Like that it just, the math isn't mathing. The math is not mathing and the way that they've played it all has been so weird. Like he was supposed to give this press conference, they called it the other day, and it was no cameras allowed. Basically like four press people there, the weirdest backdrop, uncomfortable vibes, and there was nothing, no questions were allowed to be asked. So it's like, it's a very much what are they hiding thing. I'm like, if you're missing $5 million yeah. in your bank account, somebody has to sign off on a wire transfer who's like on the account, right? You can't be like, I don't know. Right. Well, and like everything, I know. I mean, shouldn't it be Otani or like his business manager? So then I'm like, okay, was his business manager on vacation this whole time and was not getting alerts from Chase Bank? saying, hey, money is being taken out of your account in increments of upwards of potentially $500,000. Like, it's not like it's $10 at Starbucks. This is like a large chunk of money. And then on top of that, I'm like, is Otani not checking his bank account? Like, I mean, listen, you don't have to check it every day, but like every week, every two weeks. When you pay your bill at the end of the month, like maybe that. Exactly. Exactly. Like, is he not paying his credit card bill in full as you should? Like, what what's going on here? So... I don't know. I think what really strikes me is that this is a man who just signed a 10-year contract with the Dodgers for $700 million. It's a record-breaking contract. And this man is out here whittling away with his money. And apparently his interpreter has access to his bank account to maybe or maybe not pay, make these like allegedly illegal bets to this bookie. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. But I will say, I don't know if this came up at all in your research, but when Otani signed with the Dodgers, he announced the contract with an Instagram post that is a blurry Los Angeles Dodgers logo. I'm like, I saw this from you, actually. It was the way that I figured this out. Here? was from your newsletter. Oh, and I okay. pulled it up and was like... I'm, I'm really sorry, do covering the hard topics. <laughs> Absolutely. But these are like key indicators that make sports fans kind of fall down this psychological spiral of like, what's going on with my favorite player? What are they not telling us? What, yes. what are they hiding? And sports fans are all so conspiratorial. Like, I just think we're all prone to being like, oh my God, he, he only touched the bat with his left foot this time instead of his right foot. Does that mean he's going to the Yankees? Like sports fans are going to do that and have been doing right. that forever. But when, when the involvement becomes financial and you're losing out on millions of dollars, you'd think that that would raise the first red flag at the same time in the other you direction, think. you have John Tay Porter, who's trying to rake the money in allegedly uh, what happened here is one of the Toronto Raptors players is being investigated for some betting irregularities uh, that popped up around bets on himself. So people were taking what's called the under, meaning like, OK, he'll make less than fewer than four three pointers in this game. It's a pretty safe under. And then he would kind of put up those scores and mysteriously take himself out of the game. I believe uh, one of the reasons was because his eye was bothering him, that he had been poked in in another game prior. Yep. Uh, so the pension for drama remains high among NBA players, as it always has. But I'm like so, so curious how a, a player potentially betting on himself, uh, how do you ever expect to get away with that? Like, is that is just inconceivably stupid to me. It's crazy. I mean, truly, like, as I said in my newsletter, there are times where you should not be betting on yourself. And this is one of those instances. He should not be out here betting on himself when he's not good. It's not like LeBron James trying to get away with some sort of betting scheme, which he wouldn't because he's LeBron James. This player, like, is not good at all. He's on what's called a two-way contract, which if you're not familiar, it's essentially like the Kirkland signature, if you're at Costco, brand contract it's like being i don't know like um a substitute teacher like it's just it's not you're not the real teacher you know you're not maybe accredited like you kind of are but not fully 
And so he's already not good. So him having the highest like betting odds and winning amount of the night across any NBA game is going to raise a lot of red flags. It's like this man is not betting on himself, even in a smart way. It's right. like he plays bets or allegedly, allegedly plays bets. Someone he did or someone he maybe was associated with um, upwards of $20,000. It's not like these are bets of $10, $20. I mean, going back to the Otani thing, it's like this is large sums of money. Did this man think he was going to get away with this? But again, these men keep doing what men do, which is do dumb things <laughs> and think they're going to get away with it. I also saw that he had allegedly some Twitter account where he would like engage with betting and stock trade content. Right. I'm like, if you're going to do this, have a Finsta, like <laughs> have a hidden account where you're not like posting photos of people that look like yourself on the account like no. what are we doing here phone up kevin durant ask him about his burner strategy and get that shit on lock i think that's so key it's, <laughs> exactly it's, like the part that i'm like genuinely wondering about is like it seems like there's kind of two directions with athletes that this can go in you've got like tyrese halliburton who's a player on the indiana pacers saying that he feels like a prop because people are in the stands screaming at him to just make one more three so they could hit their parlay and cash out or you kind of have I think a subsect of other athletes who are quietly getting a piece of the pie as well. There was like, I think in 2023, 12 NFA NFL players were suspended for betting related activities that were technically against the NFL rules. Like I sympathize with the, with the players who feel like shit as a result of this, but worry about the, the guys on the other side who are like, let me just actually get, get pull up in the mix too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really complicated in the fact that, like, all of the major leagues now, it's not just the NBA, it's the NFL, MLB, like, this is a problem across multiple professional sporting leagues because the reality is, is that sports gambling makes a lot of money. And these leagues need money. It's like, I, I don't know the numbers, but I can't imagine that sports betting is going away anytime soon. Like, no. as you mentioned previously, with the, the inclusion of in-game betting with NBA games, like, they're only doubling down on gambling. And it's just the reality of the situation that I think these leagues need sports gambling as much as sports gambling needs these leagues. Right. You know, and I think honestly, the drama that happens with players like John Tay Porter and Shohei Otani only fuels as fuel to the fire. And it's not really going to hurt their PR, to be honest. I mean, I think it maybe might bring up more conversations about like, that how to be a healthy gambler, like they might be trying to like incorporate more educational content into games right. or something like that, which is also its own dystopian nightmare. But I don't feel like it's going away anytime soon. Like totally. we're only getting more and more sports gambling content in the games themselves. Totally. It was when I was watching the Celtics game on Saturday, it was Celtics Pelicans and on the court, the two advertising bubbles that would appear were one was FanDuel and the other was uh visit Abu Dhabi mm -hmm. so I was like okay if you're in the mix on the marketing budget with the with the Middle Eastern nations like the Qatari Grand Prix and the insane influencer yeah. trip to Saudi Arabia back in whatever year that was like that's where we're at for sure and the the 100%. interesting the interesting thing too is like starting to look at slow movements towards the government getting involved, which I think it feels a little bit like it does with AI, with social media, which like the government's playing catch up with something that is clearly already well out of hand. Um, and mm -hmm. there's actually proposed legislation in the House right now called, I think, the Safe Bet Act that would restrict like AI from targeting people uh <laughs> with specific bets that they would like because of their previous activity. It would uh, limit people to, you know, putting only making five deposits per day for 24 hours, which I'm like five deposits. That already feels like so much. Um, it would establish like a Surgeon General's report to see how it's affecting society, which they obviously do with things like social media already. Um, it feels like when we've got to that point, like it's already too far gone. But if these leagues are completely enmeshed, in this industry to the point where all of their like where their revenue is dependent upon a lasting relationship with them it seems like it's only going to get deeper from there and players are only going to spiral from there right 
A hundred percent. I mean, I feel like we're not that far off from like the DraftKings sponsoring like a docu like a documentary series about a famous athlete. And you're like, yeah, what's where's the ethical line here? I feel like we're towing the line. Like they're they're gonna get. I feel like into the content space, and like we're gonna be seeing like a bunch of sponsored content from DraftKings for athletes. Like I feel like that's gonna be allowed. Like, and it's just like these leagues are so dependent on the money. In the same way, to your point about like the Abu Dhabi, like that influence, the Middle Eastern influence, and in buying all the Premier League teams too. I mean, it's it feels kind totally. of similar. Um, and it's like it's just gonna continue because that's where the money is, and like these leagues are very reliant on the money and where they can get it. And right now it's sports gambling in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And I think about the way that it, it's like playing into, <laughs> I was trying to listen to a podcast about this today and it was like, this is a DraftKings prevent presented podcast. We are going to talk about the problems with sports betting. And I'm like, okay, that's, you know, there's a certain <laughs> irony there, but also can, will we then be able to trust that the media that we're getting our information from can can speak about this topic in with without their fingers on the scale because they know that that's at the end of the day who's pretty much writing their their paychecks. Yeah, and a lot of these news outlets now have like a gamble sports betting vertical to cover news about sports betting that's happening in sports as if you're covering breaking news about player trades. Right. Um a question that I have and this is like a topic that I bring up a lot on this show because I just find that it seems relevant to pretty much everything. And I would be remiss if I didn't bring like a, a giant Bravo allegory into this right now. So I will. Um, all, I, I really wonder if this is like an effort in, or if we should look at this as personal responsibility, like gambling and what it does and how it can ruin your life as uh, a feature of personal responsibility or if we need to look at it in a sense of like collective security and like what I compare it to is like when Leah McSweeney announced that she was going to sue Andy Cohen uh, because they were feeding her alcohol and encouraging her to drink and as a recovering alcoholic that was like so such a horrible work environment to be in and then Countess Luann Della Seps, of course came in and was like that's your personal responsibility. Like you have to take ownership of your actions. If you drank and you knew you shouldn't have be been drinking, that's nobody's fault but your own. Um, I think that's like a really interesting debate that can actually be applied to this situation with sports gambling right now. Like if somebody does fall into the hole of becoming addicted to sports gambling, do we as a society look at that as a, a failure in personal responsibility? Or is this something that we should ensure collective security around by, you know, putting in place like better mm. restrictions on apps and things that you can do per day, passing legislation, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good question. I think my answer is it's very complicated. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. I think there's some ownership and personal responsibility that goes into choosing to bet in the first place and yeah. continuing to do it if maybe even you're losing money. But also these leagues are making it very easy to get addicted. When you're watching a game and you're not asking to become a sports better, it's in your face. It's not like you can really hide it really anymore. No. It's in all the like the the bottom reel, like it's sponsored by DraftKings or sponsored by FanDuel. It's on the courts, like you can't escape it. So I think at a certain point, it, your personal responsibility ends, and like the need for legislation and restriction begins. Where can people find you? Hit a little self promo on that beat. Yeah, you can read all the sports gossip nonsense. I send out two newsletters a week at impersonalfoul.com. You can follow me on social at the impersonal foul and on Instagram for personal non impersonal foul content at mad underscore hill. So it's pretty clear to me that this is like a runaway train to a destination unknown. These sports books are going to keep getting bigger and bigger. They're going to keep showing up on the sports that we love to watch. And will it interfere with the way that we engage with the game? I'm about to figure that out when we go back to my bet. Okay, there's 40 seconds left. I put in a bet that somebody would make a buzzer beater within the last three seconds to go up by two or to make two plus points. Uh, fully honest right now, my heart is pounding. Okay, here we go. Nine seconds left. Johnson. Okay, within three. Let's see. Oh my God, do I get it? Let me put in more money. No, absolutely not. 
here we are at the end of the night. I'm about to cash out. I'm leaving the night with $84 out of my 100. I feel like I escaped pretty unscathed. Maybe some of my luck was due to wearing this Charles Barkley shirt. Guarantee that. I submitted four bets total. And yes, Scout's Honor, I literally did say that I wouldn't re-up in between the two games I watched. And then what do you know? She did. Winning my first bet was absolutely exhilarating. I cannot lie about that. But let me tell you, sitting here with my heart pounding, that anticipatory anxiety leading up to it, hard pass. I already have enough of that anxiety in my day-to-day -day life, and I don't need to double down on that, especially when I'm watching a basketball game. You know, I really have to give these apps credit, though, in a frightened way, because they certainly know how to reel you in. They offered me a $200 credit in the middle of my betting experience because I won the first one, and I took it. I placed another bet, even though I swore up and down that I wasn't gonna be that girl. But that system feels really predatory to me. The vouchers, the credits, the bonuses, and all of those escalate once you become a bigger better in their system. The VIPs get huge perks. And that really scares me because basically any kid on the block who has a pr vague proficiency in Roblox could open their parents' iPad, place a bunch of bets, and run up the credit card bill like nobody's business. How can we just kind of stop the bleeding. And to me, that starts with accessibility. It needs to be a little bit harder to get in the game. And then there needs to be more available apparent guardrails once you are in the game and it's taking over your life. I understand that you should and could and maybe would even put limits on your deposits for the day when you're sports betting, but I assume that operates kind of like how my alarm goes off in the morning, which is more of a light suggestion than a real mandate. So after this experience, it's really easy for me to see how sports betting apps take advantage of those lonely people who are looking for a little hit of that dopamine. So I'm gonna go cash out and delete this godforsaken app once and for all. So I can't say I'm going to become an elite better overnight, but what I can say is we'll be here in two weeks. So make sure you like and subscribe to WTF America so you don't miss a beat.